first in the uh, the first uh, instance of the 2009 visiting lecture series uh, presented by the the new NYU Game Center. Um, so welcome and uh, thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. I'd also like to thank the uh, the different entities that uh, make up the uh, NYU Game Center: Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Tisch School of the Arts, Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, and the Polytechnic Institute. So these are the the, the sort of collaborators that are joining forces to create a, a you know an expanded uh, uh, look at uh, at games uh, in the university. So um, I'd also like to thank the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, from whom we received a, a generous uh, cultural innovation grant. Um, that's uh, one of the ways we're able to, to put on this series. Also, uh, Sharon Chang and the TTSL Charitable Foundation and uh, other generous donors. And uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Roseanne Limoncelli and Benita Engel, who put a lot of hard work putting this thing together. So thank you guys very much. And, um, Thank you for coming. Um, I want to just uh, briefly talk about the format tonight. Um, we have Ian Bogas here, um, who's, a, who's a brilliant guy, and we're going to talk about games. Um, the, uh, the format is kind of a mix uh, between a, a lecture and, and, and an interview. Uh, Ian's going to talk for, for 20 minutes or half an hour, uh, an overview of his work and his interests. And, uh, and then I am going to ask him a bunch of questions. I'm going to put on my, my pointed. Pointed questions. Pointed. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to. Slightly blunt. I'm gonna. <laughs> I had one earlier. I'm yeah. gonna try to uh, be like a, a sort of a Charlie Rose figure and and uh, probe and uh, poke at uh, Ian. Uh, and um, I signed, and then, I already signed the, <laughs> the thing, didn't I? Yeah. And then we're gonna open it up uh, to to you guys and um, try to try to get questions um, from from all of you um, uh, for for Ian and uh, and which is you know something. Something more than just the kind of perfunctory Q&A that you often have at the end of this thing, uh, this type of thing, um, and uh, instead a, a genuine dialogue. And, and just my, my thinking here is that um, I'm really, really interested in the format of the conversation uh, as being especially appropriate to communicating about games. Because I think games themselves are kind of like Conversations, and I think that's the way that they, they generate meaning, and I think that's the way that uh, uh, that, that I would like this this lecture series to, to go. I'd want it to be a, a real conversation with uh, the people that we're inviting to to speak with us, and the extended community of NYU students and faculty, and also uh, everyone in New York City who's who's interested in games, developers and and students, and uh, and everyone else. Uh, a conversation about what games are, where they're going, and how to to best. Uh, include that in in the academy and in higher education. So, um, so that's that's the format. Um, I'm going to introduce Ian Bogost. He uh, he teaches at Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, he is the author of many important books uh, about games and culture, including Unit Operations: An Approach to Video Game Criticism, uh, Persuasive Games: The Expressive Power of Video Games, and most recently with Nick Monfort, Racing the Beam, which is the first in. Uh, a uh, platform studies series, which is looking at different kinds of uh, game hardware from a from a cultural perspective. He also is the founding one of the founding partners of a company, a game development company called Persuasive Games, which focuses on uh, games about social and political issues. So he's also an active uh, uh, practicing game designer, um, and uh, and he hates Quidditch almost as much as I do. So that's my favorite thing yeah. about him. So um, Ian Ian Bogus, uh, please. Great. Okay. Thanks uh, so much for having me here and for that warm introduction. So when, when Frank uh, invited me to, to give an overview um, of my work, it was a little frightening uh, because there's, there's a, a number of things that I've said over the years in, in various forms, and I wanted to condense it down, but it was a challenge, a, a challenge to constrain that to, uh, to 20 or 30 minutes. So what I did is I, I tried to split up everything I've been working on um, for the past, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years into these three topics or concepts, logics, rhetoric, and material. And I'm going to try to walk through each of them um, in different ways, and, uh, and then we can talk about them afterwards. So let, let's start with uh, the idea of logics. Uh, to be honest, it wasn't until relatively recently, relatively late in my, 
intellectual life and my training that I first realized that my interests in computing, poetry, and photography were essentially the same. They were just different expressions of one fundamental interest. Uh, and I wanted to look at an example of each of those as a way of describing those interests. So here is a poem uh, by Archilochus, who was a 7th century uh, BC poet and mercenary, uh, sort of an interesting dual career path that he was on. Uh, and much of his poetry is, is about the, the experience of war. It's, it's always from a, a slightly daft perspective in a certain way. Uh, and, uh, and this is an interesting poem, which, which I'll, I'll read to you in, uh, in Greek and then in, in English. So it goes in Greek. Something like that. Uh, I am both the servant of Lord Ares and also of the Muses, familiar with their lovely gifts. Uh, this is a, a fragmentary poem. There may have been more of it, but this is all that we have, and so we treat it as though it's a complete text. And what's interesting about it is that it's a poem by a poet mercenary about that very process itself, about being both a poet and a warrior, in which he muses on, uh, as it were, his different duties. Uh, and like many poems, much of the richness of this one comes from the condensation of concepts that are at work in its language. And this is difficult to understand uh, and render neatly in English, so we have to actually look at the Greek here, which is, as I'm sure what all of you were expecting tonight when you, when you came for a lecture on, on video games. Um, so one key is here in, in this structure, this men-chi structure um, that I've highlighted. Men is a, a particle in Greek that's used to mark a clause as, as correlating to another one in the same sentence. And the normal structure, the most familiar one in Greek, is men de, which is usually translated in, into English somewhat awkwardly as on the one hand, on the other hand. And we could render this poem in that fashion if we wanted to as a kind of uh, weighing of the options between uh, Ares and the Muses without uh, definitive conclusion. But in this case, um, there's a slight alteration that the poet has made, and the structure could suggest at least two other meanings. On its own, taken on its own as a particle, men usually marks uh, certainty or emphasis, which is something like, we might say, indeed in English. And this would suggest that, uh, that Ares or Enualios, the, the god of war, um, comes first, not just in the poem, as it does in the poem in the first line, but also in the mind uh, of, the, of the writer. Uh, and then the use of kai rather than de invites this reading as something like, I am first the servant of Lord Ares, and then, well, yeah, you know, uh, also of, of the muses, if you push me. But what remains ambiguous is really how the poet feels about this hierarchy of commitments, if he's happy with, with, with the state of affairs or if he would rather switch their order. Uh, but then again, also this men kai structure could be taken as a correlation of, of a sort of not only but also sort, which is how I've rendered it here in this translation, in which the first characterization of a warrior is somehow like dampened uh, by or maybe reconciled with a uh, commitment uh, to poetry. There's a kind of indecision and uncertainty at work in the poem. And it doesn't come across uh, easily in English, but it, it would come across in, 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 in Greek. That is to say, the, the ambiguity of the language itself would least lead to these readings. Uh, Archilochus uh, is both warrior and poet, uh, but for one part it's unclear to him which demands precedence, and then for another part it's unclear which one gets his preference in the end. Uh, so there's more we could say about this poem, including the use, the, the, the use of um, Enualios for Ares, uh, which is a complicated matter, but uh, I'll skip that in the interest of time. What I, would, what I would invite you to take away from this poem is the idea that it characterizes a, a fairly um, complicated idea, the logic of a kind of split affinity in the mercenary himself. So that's a poem. Um, here's a photograph. This is a photograph by Stephen Shore, who is often credited with establishing uh, color photography as a fine art. Uh, Shore shot mostly with uh, 8 by 10 view cameras. And uh, if you haven't used a view camera, they're, they're, they're large and they have interesting effects on, uh, on the photographer and on the image. One has to do with uh, just the extremely high resolution and large detail afforded by um, um, the, uh, the large 8x10 negative, um, which is something that we can't see very well in this, in this uh, low resolution image on screen. But another has to do with the way that the, the view camera itself takes pictures. Shore would have set up the camera and then put in this glass plate, this ground glass plate to frame the image, uh, and then uh, removed it to put in the film plate for the shot itself, and a wired release would trip the shutter and expose the film. And what this does for, for all view camera users, but, but for Shore in particular, was it afforded the ability to view the scene uh, he was about to capture in a kind of 
unmediated way. So he's not looking through the viewfinder of a camera or the LCD display of a camera, but uh, standing next to it, looking at the scene and waiting for the moment to arrive when he trips the shutter. He's allowed to kind of commit to the photo at a time of his choosing. And in this image, it, made it also made it possible to become a part of the photo uh, quite easily, uh, as he is here holding the wired release while, while reclining in, in this bed, and we see his, his feet. From another perspective, though, if we consider the, the blown highlights in, in the window here, um, the, the, the overexposed area out the window, this is exactly the sort of thing that modern photographers are constantly obsessing about uh, removing from their images using things like the histograms of digital cameras, as, as I've shown in the inset, um, as a tool to ensure that they, they perfectly expose uh, the highlights and then, uh, and then develop for the shadows, rather the opposite of the way that things often work in uh, film photography in the darkroom. Um, and Shore could have done the same, uh, exposed for the, uh, the, the view outside and then brought up the, the interior shadows um, during processing. But he didn't do that, and the result is striking. I think it's what makes the photograph. Uh, the blank window serves two purposes, I think. Uh, first, it becomes uh, a blank slate, a, a literal tabula rasa. The subject, uh, with whom the viewer is, is more or less superimposed, is gazing at the, the fixed reality that's depicted on the television along with this invitation in the window to invent a reality for the real world outside. Uh, the subject is a traveler, as we see. We have a suitcase, and the room appears to be a motel on his way somewhere. And there's this kind of, this kind of open road that we can, that we can uh, paste our imagination's images upon. But at the same time, there's a reflection of that world as it would have been visible uh, on the television tube. You can barely see it here, but it would have been very clear on the, uh, the original plate. And that is unalterable then the blank window becomes a kind of barrier, uh, the motel room um, more prison than, uh, than uh, a pathway to freedom. So as in the poem of Archilochus, there's an ambiguity in this, in this piece uh, that's created by depicting um, the, the, the kind of complicated dual logic of the situation. The motel room is both liberty and captivity. Then maybe take Animal Crossing, which is a video game about running away from home and living among cute beasts in a seemingly idyllic village. So uh, in Animal Crossing, uh, the player, when, when the game begins, arrives in this town by train without a penny to her name, uh, having to barter work for shelter and then to do innocuous but sometimes humiliating favors for townsfolk uh, and on behalf of the local uh, real estate uh, maven raccoon named Tom Nook. Through the earnings that one acquires through these favors, one can uh, purchase material goods like, like these, like couches and refrigerators and wallpaper, customizing the home with the latest fads and the latest trends. Now, Tom Nook, it turns out, also owns the local general store. And so uh, in the interest of, of paying back the, uh, the mortgage that one assumes, as well as purchasing goods, um, uh, Nook is able to expand his fledgling business into a thriving uh, monopoly, essentially. Here it's, it's, uh, it's advanced in, in later stages of the game to Nookington's department store from the humble beginnings as, as the, the Nook general store. Uh, there are also other local vendors who offer services for purchase, such as custom designer shirts and umbrellas, the things that anyone might need. And over time, through hard work, one can, can pay off her mortgage and, uh, as everyone who pays off their mortgage wants, expand uh, the house so that it can uh, fit more stuff in it. Uh, classic cycle of debt and consumerism is sort of supported by the game. And in fact, there's even a, a kind of uh, explicit consumerist logic that judges the player's skill in keeping up with the Joneses. Um, it's called the Happy Room Academy. And uh, once you sign up, you are issued daily notices by mail in the game about the, the, the kind of feng shui of your, of your home and how well you've outfitted it and what you might need to purchase in order to make it a better place. The game helps you keep up with the Joneses quite nicely. But then at the same time, in, in the same breath that, that speaks in favor of this, this kind of crass consumerism, Animal Crossing seems to offer just the opposite, uh, a kind of idyllic world of pristine naturalism. One can, for example, fish on its beaches or in its freshwater streams. The seasons change over time with the uh, console clock in, 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 in uh, uh, correspondence with the real calendar. Uh, the blushing leaves of autumn giving way to the first snowfall of winter and then eventually snow on the ground here, as we see. All those possessions that the player so greedily acquired earlier can be sold or even just abandoned or, or simply collapsed into these wonderful leaves and then, and then buried in the, in the soil where their worldly footprint disappears entirely. 
Players can even find artifacts and paintings and either choose to hoard them in their homes or sell them on the black market or to donate them to the local museum where other town residents might benefit from them as a kind of shared culture. The player can plant saplings and flowers and watch them grow into mature plants over time. One has to tend the land, pruning weeds and watering. And the converse of the Happy Room Academy has also offered a wishing well that passes judgment on the natural beauty of the town, channeling a kind of logic of mysticism from a higher power rather than that of, a, of fashion from a worldly one. We have in Animal Crossing thus a, a conflict between the logics of consumption and naturalism, between personal interest and community benefit that's quite complex and sophisticated. All three of these examples, I would say, characterize the logics of experiences, although they do so in different ways, of course, and in different media. Like Archilochus and, and Stephen Shore, Animal Crossing works by exposing these logics and, and refusing to resolve them, to allowing those ambiguities to resonate. The difference, of course, is that in the video game, the player can literally enact the logics themselves, feeling the experience of their pursuit rather than trying to triangulate them from inscription of read on paper or of light on emulsion. I previously suggested the name unit operation as a general way to describe the rendering of logics across media, a term that allows us to see representation as the amassing of form from logic rather than the construction of image, word, sound, or sign. Which leads us to the second topic, rhetoric. In the 1960s and 1970s, there was a, a networked lab computing system called Plato. And it was an influential computer with a multitude of innovations that would really only become commonplace in the last uh, decade, decade and a half. Uh, this is what the machine looked like, one of the workstations. It was primarily used originally for educational purposes. It was an educational computing system. And it was primarily used on, on college campuses and at institutions due, for its need to a, for, due to its need for a central uh, mini computer and a network that would allow them to communicate with one another. And uh, among the applications created for it very commonly were, were games, uh, including one called a Tenure, um, a game made in 1976 about the first year of high school teaching. And it's one of my favorite examples of an early game with a, a very clear rhetoric. Uh, so in the game, you are uh, playing the role of a, a first year high school teacher who has to get a job and uh, in interview for it and decide how to, how to set up your classroom and then decide how to manage your classroom and deal with your students and deal with personnel issues and contend with your colleagues and whatnot. And uh, there are a number of different very concrete experiences that arise uh, along, along the way. And all of these are um, choices, essentially, just simple multiple choice decisions that the player makes in the game, but which are then fed through a, a simulation of interpersonal relationships. So uh, for example, uh, once when I played and I had a, uh, uh, an encounter with one of my students who had been late for class many times, and I chose to, uh, instead of sending him to detention, to speak with him about his problems being the empathetic person that I am. Um, he says, oh, well, you know, it's, it's because Mr. Green, the math teacher, is keeping me after class, and uh, I can't get over here in time you know, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get to your class all the way across campus when he finishes the problem on the board, and so that's why I'm late, and can you please help? Um, which, rather than solving a problem, actually presents a new one, namely, how do you go deal with Mr. Green, who is a more senior teacher and, and kind of a bear of a fellow? Um, and the, the argument the game essentially makes is that uh, education, high school teaching, perhaps education of any kind, is um, as much or more about institutional politics as it is about the act of pedagogy, which is an interesting lesson for a, a potential uh, high school teacher to learn before leaving the academy and, uh, and entering the world. Uh, the question a game like this, uh, a game like this implies is, is this one. How is it that video games make arguments? Um, for one part, when we play games, we explore models of worldly logics, like the ones I've just talked about. And when we think of the word model, we normally think, I think, of the, the small version of a larger thing. We think of small versions of planes or small versions of bridges, and we want to make them small first so that we can test them or so we don't expend a lot of money in their pursuit. Uh, but more broadly, we can, we can generalize the notion of the model. And when we do so, it suggests the smaller, abstracted version of a more complex system. Model is just another word we can use to describe the logic by which things work, whether those things be war or loneliness or consumerism or organizational politics or anything else at all. In fact, 
the incredible generality of computational representation makes it possible for software to depict all manner of worldly processes from the physical properties of a realistic world to the dynamics of energy policy and beyond. In computing and related fields, we sometimes uh, call this trait procedurality, the computer's ability to construct complex behaviors driven by many variables that a user can manipulate and explore. Computational models, I would say, make arguments about how things work. And I've used the name procedural rhetoric to describe this phenomenon, the construction of arguments through computational processes, computational processes that themselves describe real world processes. Now video games are really just a kind of computer model, uh, but they are one that is oriented more toward the representation of human experience and ideas than other kinds of software. With video games, one can model, for example, how civilizations expand or how aircraft fly and how aviation rules are managed, or the practices of Japanese feudal espionage, <laughs> or even how universities are run, which I know is the, the, the game that you're all hoping that you'll get to play when you get home tonight. But for another part, the players of games take on roles, roles in which they make decisions that are constrained by the logics of the model implemented in the game. Now, typically, we think of the roles offered by most commercial video games as ones that involve largely the power fantasies of adolescent boys, that of the pro ball player or the space marine or what have you. But of course, we can look more closely. And if we do, I think the role uh, video game play affords is much broader than that. Now, in general, playing a role just means simulating an experience of some kind. And, and every child knows this intuitively. But the computer model of a video game allows the enforcement of the rules of the model's logic on that role play. It makes us play a role in accordance with designed constraint rather than as a free-for-all. For example, we can play as a pro footballer subject to the rules of international play, or as an attorney subject to the evidentiary demands of a court, or a criminal subject to the back alley logics of organized crime, or a member of the underclass in Colonial Williamsburg subject to social conventions, or a Fur refugee in Darfuri, Sudan. And there is, I think, a powerful concept of empathy at work in this process, uh, one for players that doesn't mean adopting or embracing the roles that they play in games, but experiencing the constraint of those different rules on the roles that they play. In games, then, players make uh, games uh, then make arguments by inviting players to experience a procedural rhetoric, by inhabiting a world in a role constrained by the logics of a model. In these situations, players experience immersion of a different kind than we usually use to describe our medium. It's not the visual or sensory immersion that we might talk about, the holodeck dream, but rather a kind of logical immersion, that of the constrained experience of particular rules, roles. Part three, material. Uh, there is a long history of material constraint in human creativity. Uh, from the impressions of reed on clay in Sumerian cuneiform, to the mnemonic and metrical device of the Homeric epithet, to the logically constrained arbitrary writing demands of the ulipo, to the relationship between the size of silver halide crystals on a film emulsion, the light sensitivity of the film, and the optical texture of the resulting photograph. The best creators and critics in any medium are well aware of how materiality facilitates and constrains certain types of expression and innovation. And it's really time for us to consider seriously the lowest level of computers and to understand the way their material relationships relate to and inform culture and creativity. To this end, Nick Montfort and I have suggested the name platform studies for the process of exploring the relationships between the hardware and software design of standardized computing platforms and the creative works that have been produced upon them. When you think about it, really, computational creativity operates on many levels. The creator of a computational work might design circuits and solder chips. Or this author might write instructions for the integrated circuits and microprocessors of a particular computer. Or she might write software in a high-level programming language like Java. Or create 3D models to be added to a virtual world. Or to create digital video for embedding in a website. When digital media creators choose a platform, 
They simplify develop development and delivery in a number of ways, but the work that is built for that platform is also supported and constrained by what the platform can do. A well-defined example of a platform is this one, the, uh, the, the, the most important video game system ever made, the 1977 Atari VCS, uh, which was the first popular home video game console and also uh, the subject of the book that Nick and I wrote. Its hardware design was, was weird, super weird, and strongly driven by cost considerations, which led to a number of remarkable decisions, and these decisions inadvertently and indirectly and ambiguously influenced the way software had to be written on the machine, which in turn influenced the particular games that were created for it, uh, and then influenced uh, through their influence on other games, uh, the kind of conventions and genres that we see in video games today. There are a lot of things I, I could talk all day about the Atari, but the, the most important uh, uh, design element of the, of the machine was a specialized chip called the Television Interface Adapter, uh, Television Interface Adapter, or TIA, uh, a custom chip that was, uh, that was developed for the machine to handle the interface between the processor and the television display. It was responsible for graphics and sound, essentially. Now, um, one thing to remember about the way that a television works, the way that a CRT works, is that uh, it doesn't draw the screen all at once, but rather line by line with its electron beam scanning uh, from side to side and then resetting and scanning the next line and so forth all the way down the screen until it's reached the bottom, in which it turn case it turns off and returns to the top. And it does this 60 times a second. Uh, now, to save memory and, uh, and uh, avoid the need for additional video RAM, the machine has no video RAM whatsoever, um, the programmer must interface directly by means of the TIA, which with every line, every scan line of the television picture. Uh, it does not have a frame buffer like modern computer systems in which we take some image and we write it to some place in memory and then we flip the buffers to put that memory on screen. Instead, when, when drawing a screen of the Atari, we've got to take the TIA and put instructions, uh, put values via instructions into the proper registers on it to construct every scan line of the television display one by one. It, it, we might think of the, the picture, the resulting picture, um, uh, not so much as an image, as, as more like a, a, a process of writing, to kind of borrow the, uh, the metaphor that McLuhan uses about the television. And it's a constraint that helps explain in part the, the, the rows of colors apparent in VCS sprites, as seen here in Pitfall Harry. You'll notice the, the horizontality of the colors and they, how they reset from line to line rather than pixel to pixel. Uh, or here in the, the Aurora Borealis effect in Frostbite, uh, where the, the different colors are changed on a line-by-line -line basis and, and the ability of the machine to render 128 colors, which was a large number at the time, made it possible to, to produce effects like this. Um, the, the CRT's phosphor bleed, its tendency to bleed individual lines together, uh, would have accentuated this visual effect, not to mention the glow of the screen itself. A combat, in fact, which was designed while the hardware was being developed, is almost a pure demonstration of the affordances of the machine showing how its creators imagined the system might be used. We have in combat uh, two sprites, which is what the TIA provides memory for, uh, a background, and a set of low resolution playfield graphics. In fact, the, the horizontal symmetry that you see in combat and other games on the Atari speaks partly to the system's design as a two player system. Each player with his own side of the screen, we would have sat side by side, two players in front of the television playing, literally leveling the, leveling the playing field of sorts. This practice was facilitated, if not encouraged, by providing only half as much memory on the chip for rendering the play field as the screen required. You see here the two and a half bytes of memory that were allocated. And uh, doubling or mirroring the, uh, the image was simply a matter of flipping a bit on one of the TIA's registers. Uh, the, same, uh, the same kind of limitations allowed the, uh, the machine to triple or stretch or double different sprites in different forms, which we see here in the case of these, uh, these uh, airplanes. These constraints influenced convention and genre in often surprising ways. Uh, when Warren, Warren Robinett set out to create an adaptation of Crowther and Wood's famous uh, adventure or colossal cave for the VCS, he faced a, a major challenge. Adventure, of course, uses only text as input and output, either on a display like this or on a teletype. Uh, but the Atari has no facility whatsoever for text. What Robinet came up with as a solution was to interpret Adventure's spaces as individual screens on the television, with a player cursor able to move between them by walking off one side of the screen and onto the opposite side of another. Uh, likewise, Robinet adapted many of the verbs of Adventure, which we would have typed in, get lamp, uh, into two basic functions, contextual collision, running into things, and button presses. Collide with a sword to pick it up, collide the sword with a dragon to slay it, press the button to drop the held object. 
These techniques, which were tied somewhat arbitrarily to the, to the peculiarities of the VCS, soon became conventions of the graphical adventure genre, which this game essentially inaugurated. But they had to be explained in, in considerable detail. This is part of the manual of the, of the adventure uh, 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 game. And you see that the, the player is instructed that to move from one area to the adjacent one, move off the television screen through one of the openings. This would, would have not, not, wouldn't have felt natural at the time, as it does to us. Of course, over time, these conventions were adopted and further developed in games like Raiders of the Lost Ark, also for the Atari or Ultima or The Legend of Zelda, which is maybe where we're most familiar with this technique, and on into contemporary 3D games, although it's evolved considerably by then. <coughs> now, platforms themselves are layered and often contain one another. For example, the, the Intel x86 instruction set as architecture has facilitated the creation of many types of software, among them the operating system Windows 98. And that operating system, in turn, offers software development frameworks, such as uh, the MFC classes available in C++, the development of which facilitate the use of other programs, such as, let's say, Flash, which in turn serves as a platform for multimedia creation. So we see a kind of nested nature to platforms. Uh, the study of, of creativity on the computer can take a number of focuses. Uh, and Nick and I have distinguished between five of them. Uh, reception at the top level focused on the experience of the user with the work. Interface focused on the user's relationship to the visible, operable part of the computer system. Form and function focused on the operation and behavior of the program itself. Code focused on the way that a work is programmed and understood by programmers. And then at the bottom, platform focused on this abstraction layer beneath the code. Very frequently, effective studies of digital media will draw from multiple levels of this model. Uh, but we, want, we specifically want to endorse the platform layer as one that's been underexplored, really, especially in, in humanistic considerations of, of video games and other kinds of digital media. Now, these three areas of interest uh, <coughs> correspond roughly with the three books I've written on games. And these are the places I'd invite you to pursue for uh, peruse for, for more information uh, about each of those. And that's where I'll end. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, um, so um, are these available online anywhere? Could I purchase these on Amazon, for example? Oh, Amazon would, <laughs> would sell them to you, in fact. Um, all right, so are you ready for the probing part of the, uh, of the evening? Yes, I've, all right, I've, good. I lubed up beforehand. Um, so I'm gonna, I, have, I have some questions I'm going to ask you, and then, um, and then I hope you guys are thinking of things that you want to uh, probe in <laughs> directions you'd like to, uh, to explore further. I, um, well, my contract says I can be probed by everyone. I'm going to yeah. start by going back to that first thing you did with the poem and the photograph and Animal Crossing. So it's, it was lovely. Uh, and, but I kind of want to challenge it a little bit because um, it's so par part of the premise of, of uh, I, I, my approach to, to games. And, and I think that um, uh, a consensus that's, I hope, starting to build and one that I think all sensible people are, are moving towards, games are like photographs and poems, right? They're aesthetic objects. They're, they're part of this kind of, they're, they're a creative form, right? They're a creative, whether you call them an art form or whatever, they're, they're a form of creative culture. They're aesthetic. Um, and yet, it didn't feel like those were three similar things, right? So you showed this fragment of a poem, and it was lovely and kind of haunting and, and very clearly meaningful in a kind of uh, interesting way, and, and, the, and the dynamic of the meaning that you teased out was right there on the surface. And, uh, and then this photograph, of course, really lovely and kind of haunting and, and, and beautiful. And again, you, you can kind of explain uh, the, uh, uh, the effect by, by looking at this conflict in between these two ways of, of thinking about the, the, you know, the, what the image means. Um, uh, but, it's, but you start by feeling it, right? There it is, and, and you get it, and then you can kind of look at it more deeply. Uh, and then Animal Crossing, which it looks like a children's toy, right? It just looks like, um, it doesn't look like those other two things. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't look like it's made for grown-ups. It doesn't look like it's uh, meaningful. It, it, for those of us who played it, I don't, It'd be hard for me to say that it really feels like those two other things. So, so I guess I just want to question. I want to question that. I want to. I want to challenge that and and, and ask you. I mean, do you feel like those? Oh, those obviously those three things go together because I, I want them to. Yeah, I, I mean, they're they're. I'm not saying they're the same thing, but the the construction of them is, comes from the same place, uh, which is this this desire, this need, to take the world as it works and ask, gosh, like, what is it all about? How does it function? And then the rendition of that opinion 
uh, can take different forms. It can take the written form. It can take the, uh, the, the, the form of a captured image bent to the aperture of, of, of the camera or through this, this rendering of this, this simulated persistent world. The, the aesthetics of those three works are actually pretty darn different from one another. Um, now, what's interesting, and the observation that you're, that you're pointing to, is that um, Animal Crossing um, doesn't look like and was not sold as and never, never made any, any purported effort to be a, a deep game about the relationship between naturalism and consumerism. But there it is. It's, I think it's fairly obvious on the surface of the game once you play it. Uh, so there's also an, you know, there's an issue of context at work, and there's a whole range of other cultural factors. This doesn't explain any of those three, uh, those three works completely. But I think it gets at the, a, a kind of fundamental underlying process that we go through when we make things, when we represent ideas um, in any medium, that we're, we're trying to capture the, the logic of something and then render that logic through the form of the medium. So you think the starting point for the, for the people who made Animal Crossing was a similar starting point to, the, the, to a photographer or, or, or a poet? Uh, wanting to reflect something about the world, wanting to express something about the world? Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if that's... I, I, I can't buy it f fully. Well, I can't you know, buy and, it And fully. the great thing is that we, we can't ask... I guess we could ask Stephen Shore. Uh, but we, we didn't trust any of their answers anyway. That's, yes, I, I guess... Mean, one you're, of the rights like, we I, have I, as maybe, critics is to, is to say whatever we want about, about, about works, as long as there's, there's evidence in the work for them. Yes, and I very much want to say what you're saying, but I also... I, I want to be true to, to oh, the truth. Sure. Well, I mean, one way, to, one way to look at it is that, is that that very ambiguity in Animal Crossing is something that we could interrogate a little bit. We could say, well, you know, it, it might be the case that this was a child's toy that accidentally turned into a fairly subtle and somewhat sophisticated critique of contemporary culture. Yeah. Or it might be that that was the intention all along. Now, whether it matters or not is a different question. Right, because, but I think it does matter because I think in the case of both the poem and the photograph, those inner workings, the conflict between these different kinds of meanings, those are present to the, to the reader and the viewer. They're part of the enjoyment. Whereas if, if we say of, of video games, if, if that Animal Crossing example is paradigmatic, then, then we're saying, and in the case of video games, it's more accidental. It's there under the hood. Well, I don't you, think it's, I, th I think it's very it, obvious but, in Animal Crossing. You think it's a main think it's part right of the, the enjoyment surface. of Animal Crossing for the people who It's not who do possible play it? to ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder if, if I think one place that, that I might uh, question that relationship between those three things is, is precisely in the, the, the aspect of representation, right? Because um, I think in your work, there seems to be a, a, a very strong focus on the representational quality of games. Um, and I mean, I, I sometimes, and maybe I err in the, in the other direction, but I, I sometimes feel that uh, there, is, there is a, a lighter relationship mm -hmm. between representation mm -hmm. and, and form you in do games feel that way. than in almost any other <laughs> than almost any other uh, uh, any other form. You of almost culture. said it. You I almost, almost said, said medium. The yeah, games are I, not a medium. I heard the mm, there's medium. that mm. labial thing going on. Was, it's the, a delicious yeah. form of culture. Mm. So. Um, <laughs> so, for example, like so, uh, the, the, my my go to analogy is music. Right. Whenever sure. someone shows me a, a, a poem or a film. Um, uh, or a photograph in relationship to a game. I always try to replace it in my head with a with a yep. piece of music, mm -hmm. which I think has a has a much lighter uh, relationship between the form and the meaning right. of the thing and and the representational part of it. Like lyrics are important in a lot of songs, but they're not well. The essential and and part in some in some songs, they're more and less important than in yeah. others. Right? So so the difference between you know some some uh, dance track that you would play at a club and a Bruce Springsteen song, um, they're different. Uh, and there's no reason why, why games couldn't be the same, where we have uh, different levels of, uh, of expression at work, some more and less representational than others. So um, is, there a, is there a game that you could have thrown up there as the third uh, example that would have felt kind of more of a piece with those other two things? Something that, oh, yeah, this is a piece of grown-up culture that's clearly meaningful and, and beautiful and, and interesting and carries the, the weight of the... Well, we could let Animal Crossing be that if we wanted to. I mean, there I mean, are. So maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe it. Does, maybe it. Yeah. Maybe I think, it's just I think it's my also perception. Possible to, I think it's also. I think you know the, the work of looking at the poem and the photograph as important and obviously uh, uh, relevant, expressive forms of culture. That's not accidental. It's just that we're more familiar with it. It's also possible to look at that picture of a guy in a motel room and go, "What the hell is this?" Right. Um, or to look at the two lines of poetry and say, two lines of, of poetry that say, 
nothing. Yeah. So I think I think you may be overestimating the obviousness of of the other two works and and their yeah. relationship to to deep ideas. I think that's an excellent excellent point. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of clouded by my own kind of historical position and, and thinking about these things. Oh, and perhaps you know perhaps in time things will reverse and and the 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 games will become very obvious and then we'll look at these strange photographs these these these, these images that people took on on celluloid and what were they thinking about? Um, let me let me ask you about. Serious games. Oh, good. Is it, is it correct to get, to give you some credit for the establishment of serious games? Who knows what serious games are? Raise your hand if you are familiar with the topic of serious games. Um, put your hands up if you if you work in serious games or you're interested in serious games as a as a research. Kara Tidy, why is your hand not up? Yes, <laughs> serious <laughs> games. So um, so you you are at least partly responsible for for the fact that serious games is kind of a big deal now. Um, I hope. And I, I guess. I are guess. you? I'm not sure. Are, is that problematic for you? Or are you <laughs> yeah, excited yeah, about that? No, it's, it's really Tell problematic me. for me. Um, Why? Well, because it's it's not um, the way that serious games understands itself. If it does, in fact, understand itself as a domain, is not the way that I understand my work or the work that I'm interested in doing, or the work I think many people should be interested in doing. So the story we usually hear from serious games proponents goes something like, "Video games are a hot commodity." But there's not just games for entertainment. You can also use games for, and then you fill in the blank. You know, treating, tr teaching soldiers how to kill people, right. or um, uh, curing you know, cancer, curing cancer, or or what have you. Peak oil. Um, they curing are, peak they, oil. <laughs> <laughs> curing peak oil. Yes. Uh, so there's this idea that there's these useless, you know, uh, uh, entertainment games, and now we've got this this useful. We're taking the waste of this medium and rescuing it from itself, and making serious games, which are serious and they're, thereby value. They have value in. And I think that's really problematic uh, for a lot of reasons. One being that I'm not so sure that the entertainment games are, are useless in that way. Another being that I'm not sure the so-called serious games are useful in the way that they claim to be. But, but moreover, uh, I, I'm not so sure that it's such a black and white scenario. I think that what serious games has become as a domain, and, and this is what I write about in, in the Persuasive Games book, is essentially a name for games produced by institutions to serve their interests. So when the government makes a game for the army, then it's a serious game. When a health organization makes a game about diabetes management, then it's a serious game. When an NGO makes a game about why you should be concerned about whatever you should be concerned about, then that's a serious game. Um, and that's what the, that's, in practice, that's what the term is meant. That's what the concept is meant. But I'm much more interested in the idea that games of any kind can make arguments about things. And yeah, I've made some games about politics and about social issues. And maybe that looks like uh, an endorsement of serious games and a, um, a slap on the hand of entertainment games. But in fact, I see things much more broadly than that. And it's frustrating sometimes to be accused of being a, a serious games developer or a serious games proponent, when in fact, uh, I think the, 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 the message I'm trying to send is much more general, that you can make an argument with games just as you can make an argument with writing. And whether you use that writing for, uh, for a novel or for a, a white paper is, is really and, up and, to you. And, and you think the primary uh, method by which games make arguments is is models, is that correct to say? That it's kind of it's one of the ways. The, 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 it's the it's the native way, I okay. suppose, that the okay. games make arguments. But there's also obviously there's a lot of media that we can we can cram into games, and so we can have um, we can have sure. visual arguments, and we can have textual arguments, we can borrow all that stuff. Right. But you the thing that we put can't put stats up on the screen right. and yeah, make but traditional the, the, arguments. Right. Yeah. But the thing that we can't get in, in other media easily, um, at least other media that are non-computational. Um, is this idea of, of building a model and interacting with that model as an argument. So here's the, the thing that I've always struggled with, with this idea of, of using models for, for argument. Um, you show me a model that you've built of something, and, and you point to its behavior, and you say, look, that's what happens. That's what happens when you, you, you do this thing. And I say, no, that's what happens in your model, because mm -hmm. you put into your model whatever it was that you wanted yeah, to, that's, to, that's exactly to right. demonstrate to me. That's exactly right. So how is that persuasive? Well, how is you know giving a speech about your position on an issue persuasive? It's the same thing. Here's my idea of the world. But you summon presumably because you summon evidence. You point yeah. to things that I haven't seen before, and yeah. I oh you're right, I hadn't noticed that. Right. And then you show me you 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 carry me along with certain logic. You say well if you believe this, you really have to believe this. You believe this, and you believe that you know. And I'm like oh, okay, I see your point. But 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 pointing to to a model doesn't quite do the same thing. Well, one of the problems, the, the one that you're tracing the edges of, is that it's hard to express transparency in, in games and in computer models in general. It's hard to, to describe or depict 
the assumptions the model's making, you know, the variables that it's using. This is a big open, open question. And one way to do it is to say, well, no, it's, it's all there. It's, it's in the way that the model behaves. So when you play any game and you explore how it does whatever it does, how SimCity handles you know, your policy changes, or how Animal Crossing handles your financial decisions, then you, uh, you understand what, at some level, what its inputs and outputs are. Um, and then there's this other opinion, which is that, well, really, in order to understand what's going on, you have to look under the hood. And one way of looking under the hood would be you know, to like open up the patient and look at the code, although that, that's not really sufficient either. It's, it would be like opening up the brain of the orator or something and yeah. assuming that, that that gives you direct access to his assumptions. Um, another would be uh, uh, a complaint, you know, we could, we, could, we could issue a complaint about the fact that a, that a model is biased, and so we should be able to put knobs on it in order to, to change the assumptions. But of course, then it's not an argument anymore. It's right. just a system with many possible arguments. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. So, so Sounds good to me. So, yeah, I like well, and, and, and you know, that, would, uh -huh. that might be an interesting artifact. The, the, key, yeah. is, the key is, what, what is the goal? What are we trying to do with, with, these, um, with so these specific let, examples of games? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been persuaded by a game? Have you ever had your mind changed by a game about a specific topic? Well, I think that the you know the the idea that we have about persuasion is a little bit is a little bit backward and simplistic in general. You mean the idea so, I have about not, no, not no, the, no, no, the no. idea you have about persuasion is <laughs> no. I think that culturally, culturally we you know when we talk about the word rhetoric, what we assume it means is lies. You know that the politician tells you lies, and you have to not believe them, and he's using rhetoric, um, or that that it's about changing your mind in some very obvious way. So, for example, I uh, I try to convince you um, you know that. Uh, my favorite policy issue is right or wrong, and then um, you, you know, magically, miraculously buy it or don't buy it. Um, and that is, one, that is one kind of rhetoric. Uh, it certainly corresponds with, with the, uh, the classical notion of oratory for civic purposes, for example, defending yourself in court or something. Um, but as the, as the millennia have passed, this idea of, of making an argument has become much more complex and much more nuanced. So we're not necessarily trying to make people uh, you know, uh, do something or not do something, but rather change the way that they think about an issue. And yeah, many games have given me a new perspective or a different perspective on a topic. So like, for example, what's a... Is there one that pops to mind? Not to put you on the spot, but um, well, actually, I mean, a game that I've been playing a lot of lately, um, and that I just brought up a minute ago, is SimCity. And and SimCity is is an interesting game because it points to, it, not because it's a good representation of, of of a city, but because it points to certain dynamics that one might or might not imagine are at work in the health uh, of uh, of an urban environment. And those dynamics are, are sort of counterintuitive if you if you haven't thought about urban planning before. Unfortunately, everyone has already thought about urban planning because we've all played SimCity. Mm -hmm. But but you know but the, the notion um, the notion that a combination of uh, of renewal of structured renewal um, uh, a transit policy and um, uh, and creative taxation can have some impact on the way that cities grow. There you go. That's that's a, a setup, and it's totally broken in the game. By the way, I mean right. it, it doesn't work properly. Um, but the notion that those are the those are some of the variables that are, that are at work in the health or 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 or, or, uh, or, or illness of an urban environment. Um, th that's an example. Um, the the idea that um, when you play a game like Animal Crossing, that there is a, a kind of a an unseen uh, conflict in your life between acquiring goods and experiencing nature. Right. That's an argument. Um, it's it's not an argument that tries to get you to go and plant a garden or to stop buying CDs. It's something that, that it maybe influences the way that you think about the world that might cash out later or might not. It also sounds like an argument that it's not being made by the person who necessarily created the game, but it's kind of being made by the game itself, right? It just emerges from the game. Is that in the case of Animal Crossing? Would you agree with that? I don't think that was put into the game by someone yeah, well, intentionally saying, "Oh, I want to persuade." people about this idea. Right, Instead, right. they okay. built this artifact, right. and then so, so one of you're the things, finding this meaning yeah, that yeah. comes out of it. One yeah. of the things that you're pointing to is an, another confusion that we often have about, about rhetoric and what it is, which is that rhetoric means that I, some agent with intention, looks to you, some other agent, with, with the ability to act, and I, agent A, am trying to get you, agent B, to do something. Um, whereas, in fact, you know, we talk, when we talk about rhetoric yes. um, in general, forget about ga computer games, yeah. we're also talking about you know, just the nuance of expression, the idea of, of, of effectively expressing and, 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 and interpreting right. systems in the world, right. um, whether those are, um, uh, are, 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 are books or, 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 or speeches or video games. So you know, the, one of the problems, I think, that we have with this whole idea of, um, uh, of changing our minds about things is that we, we seem to assume, quite weirdly, um, that we do so uh, in a very particular way, 
when in fact, uh, even when we listen to a speech or we read a web page or, or we do all the things that we do in the course of making a decision about something, like who to vote for, um, those processes are all com in intertwined with one another. And we very rarely make decisions of that sort. It's only when we're forced to go to the polls and, and, and pull the lever. Normally, these things like stew, mm -hmm. and, and, and they, work, they work against us and with us. And then over time, we reflect back and we think, oh, you know, um, yeah, the perspective that I have now on, on a certain topic is related in complex and intimate ways to the, the ideas I've experienced through, um, through media of various forms. Do you think that um, games have something to teach us about the new depression that we're entering? <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, you know, w one reason to believe so is because th there are these extremely complicated scenarios that brought them on. And, you know, we could say that understanding something about the, the nature of our financial systems, uh, for example, and what went right or what didn't go right, um, that that would be a useful bit of information to have. But, but obviously, uh, more interestingly, if we projected and we imagined, well, how ought we to live our lives now or differently or what are the, what are the sorts of plans that we might put in place, they're going to be equally complicated because the scenario and its resolution is, is not you know, a matter of, uh, of stamping the right, uh, the right piece of paper and you know, the, the save the world legislation has gone through and now we can all sit easy and start spending money again. So there's the potential, uh, certainly, that you know, this idea of having like, a, a complicated system that we could interact with and, make, and have, have all these multivariable decisions that would be, you know, there would be many trade-offs and it wouldn't be a matter of uh, passing the bill or not passing the stimulus bill. You know, that could perhaps, perhaps not um, help us get out of it, but maybe uh, maybe uh, encourage the public to have a long view of all of the complicated factors that are at work in some sort of recovery. Now, that's not the kind of answer that most people would want to hear, right? They want to hear, yes, you play um, Save the Economy video game, and then after you've played it, you save you know, the economy. Yes, 70% yeah. of players yeah. saved the economy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's, just, that's yeah. just not how the world works. Um, <laughs> let me... Uh, let me shift gears and, and ask you, uh, do you, do you play games for pleasure? Do you? I try, I, yeah, I, I play games yeah. for pleasure. What are, you, what are you playing right now for fun, for enjoyment, for pleasure? Uh, for fun, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm trying to play. Um, Please say Drop 7. Oh, should no, I say? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. I have been playing a lot of Drop 7, but not, not for fun. Available yeah, online? Yeah. Okay. Only for competition yeah. with, my, with my wife. <laughs> and you know, it's a constant back and forth. Of, yes, it is. Uh, the, yeah, I, I've been. I've been um, I've been playing um, Far Cry 2, and I've been playing um, 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 oh, what's the other one with the the one that has the same title, but you're uh, Far Cry no. One. Yes, Far Cry One. No, um, Fallout. 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 It's the Fallout same, three. Same sounding, same yeah. sounding name. Um, and I've been playing all of these iPhone games, actually, uh, not Drop Seven so of much, course. but uh, <laughs> but but some of the so because you know I'm interested in that platform. I've been trying to understand what works and what doesn't on the on the platform. I guess that's not yeah. for fun, is it? That's for for work. Uh, it's it's might, hard. Um, so uh, one question that sometimes comes up in so in in um, talking about games to people who are just starting to get interested in games, uh, and I think that's a more and more people are starting to get interested in games, starting to pay attention to games. Uh, sometimes the question comes up, what, what games should they play? So for someone who hears that games are super interesting, they get a whiff of the excitement that's happening in games, this new spirit of, of, of games that are smarter and more sophisticated and more meaningful in all these ways, and games as aesthetic objects and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they, they kind of want a taste of that. Mm -hmm. um, where so they, they, they're not they, familiar with games. They're, yeah, they're, they're kind, kind of, of not familiar with games. I, do you know yeah. people like this? Probably? Sure, sure, of so course. Where, yeah. where do people like that, where, where's a good place for them to jump in? And, and Pong. Really? So you think they should go back to basics and... I think it's one entry point. Yeah. Rather than saying, here's World of Warcraft, say, here's Pong, and then, you know, here's <laughs> um, Tank, here's uh, Asteroids. Wow. Here's... Uh, so, so, you know, w one of the... One of the yeah, one of the one of the benefits that, that that many of us have had having having kind of grown up with video games as yeah. video games evolved uh, as a form, is that we've we've naturally watched them develop and we've been a part of their development. This yeah. is the same thing with the microcomputer in general. You know, so one of the reasons that that um, that it's easy for me to know some of the things that I know about computers is that in the early '80s I was able to make the personal computer do almost anything that it could do, but. Um, 
if I had been um, you know, the, the same age in, 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 in recent years, I couldn't make my Xbox do everything that it could do. Right. So yeah, I think in, in, one strategy is to, to kind of go back and look at the evolution of the mediums, look at it historically. This is what we would do yeah. with other forms, right? We would look at maybe the evolution of film yeah. historically. So I'm, I'm, I'm into the idea of a historical perspective and then working our way, our way back up. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a dilemma a little bit because more and more I'm, I'm realizing that it's hard to uh, to point to the qualities that I love so much um, about games in any individual single game. Yeah. Like, oh, well, this obviously has all of the things that I like about games, but yeah. instead it's more like well, one of ev the... every game is is responding to all the games that came before right. it and, and the sure, games that right. are going to come after it. And, and one of the problems with, uh, with so we have this field, the so-called field of game studies, and it's just done a really shitty job of doing that I work. Agree. You know, so it, we, Jesper, we should, yeah. What the, what the fuck? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You should, you should have work that you can point to and read that's written in intelligible language that right. someone could look at and understand. But, but we don't really have that. Yeah. But is there, should there be this, uh, like a canon? I mean, is that something oh, that... The canon. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, let, I me, mean, let me... Okay. You know, the, the whole concept of the canon is a political idea. It's, 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 it's made for organizations to argue about. It's not really for normal people. Yeah, I have a very practical desire to like be able to point to you know, people who are interested in games or becoming interested in games and be able to sure. like say, here's what it means to really be literate yeah. about games. You're not going to enjoy games until, just like if they were interested in jazz music, they kind of yeah. they have to start yeah. somewhere, understand what a standard is, and then how standards right. are, you know, their variations, and then that's mm -hmm. kind of built off of that. Yeah. Um, well, I actually think, you know, if you, I mean, you brought up Jesper, and, and he did this, this interesting yes. piece on the, the puzzle, the, the casual puzzle Match game. three. Yeah, yeah. The, and, and tried to look at the evolution of, of influence. Yeah. And so, you know, there's an example of something that we can point to about that particular particular kind of game, uh, and we don't have that for all kinds of games, but the more right. of that stuff that we have, then you can do that kind of family relationships. Sort of and, and, and kind of the, turning that question around, uh, one of the things that people talk about a lot is the, the Citizen Kane of, of games, right? That right. eventually, we're, that we're kind of... It was stupid. With bated question. breath, we're right. waiting yeah. for this one thing that will be no. an obvious masterpiece no. that we it, can all point to. So you think that's... that's I don't that's, think that's how that's the world works happen. anymore. I don't think there are masterpieces anymore. So this is not just a property of games as a, as a creative right. form. This is really a property of the Everything modern world. Everything is just far too distributed. Yeah, now. even Citizen Kane is not really Citizen Kane. Right. It's Citizen Kane may not be the Citizen Kane of films. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, I want to I open it up to, to you guys and get some questions from the audience. Uh, before I do, w real quick, I want you to just talk about your work as a game developer. You have two iPhone games out now, right? I mean... Well, I've got um, you've got, got this Jet game Set. called Jet Set Out, which yeah. is a game a game about airport airport security that you play yeah. in airports and and you can play while you're in, in line at the airport in airport security, um, and it, it was interesting for a lot of reasons. I mean, it was a kind of adaptation of an earlier so-called news game or editorial game that we'd done about this issue back in 2006, and we wanted to bring it to the iPhone partly to, to see how the iPhone thing worked, but then also I, I really wanted to do a, a I've wanted to do a kind of airport location-based game for some time, and this allowed us to do something that you can play in different airports, and there are these, these kind of uh, unlockable trophy-like things that you can get, you know, souvenirs, um, which then you can give to people or hoard. And it was, it was also, so the metagame functions as a kind of commentary on the, the whole idea of business travel and, and goals and frequent flyer programs and all of that, too. And then there's Guru Meditation, Guru Meditation is out yet? Is, is it out is, yet, or it's coming, not out yet. coming so, soon? So Guru Meditation is a, a game that I'm, probably the, the only game that will ever be simultaneously released on the Atari VCS and iPhone. Uh, <laughs> and it's a, it's a meditation game. There's a backstory which I don't want to spend too much time on, but there was a, a peripheral made by Amiga in 1982 called the Joy Board, and it, it's uh, kind of the spiritual precursor to the Wii Balance Board. Although we will, you know, Nintendo will never talk about this; they just stole the idea from from Amiga 25 years ago. And it's a platform, and you stand on it, and it acts as a joystick. And they, it came with a skiing game, actually, just like Wii Ski. I mean, almost identical, except it, it looked much better. <laughs> and, and you you stand at it, and you kind of rock uh, to, to play. Um, so there's this, this, this kind of apocryphal story about the, the original programmers of the Amiga operating system getting so frustrated with their long builds and their crashes that they would, in order to, like, to kind of relax while the, while the builds were, were rebuilding, um, they would try to sit still on the joy board um, for as long as they could. And the, the rumor is that they made this, this game, and this whole idea turned into the Amiga OS error message, which is called a guru meditation. So the, the kind of equivalent of the blue screen of death from Windows in Amiga, it says Guru Meditation, and it has a number code after it. 
So I, I've been interested in this this lore for some time, and also I have this interest in, in physical interfaces and you know um, uh, kind of exercise and games and that sort of thing. And at the same time, I have these gripes about uh, about games like Flow that are you know supposed to be re relaxing, but, but I find incredibly stressful. Um, so I wanted to make a game that would be a, a real meditation game, a, a game that would it, it actually relax you. And, and for me, that meant that you would not interact with it, that it would require a lack of interaction. So, and then the Atari has all these properties of, of, of simplistic visuals, which is something I wanted to keep on the iPhone. And the iPhone has the similar sensors. It's got the, the accelerometer, and cool. you, can, you can hold it still. And so when's so. that coming out? So Jet Set's out it, now, Jet and you can get out. it Guru, Guru Meditation will be out um, for, for everyone on iPhone and for 10 lucky people in a special edition on nice. Atari in cartridge form. And there's a, it'll come with a joy board and all that. At the end of the month. End of the month. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So let's, do people have questions that they want to join in? All right. You, sir. Yes. You. In the, in the striped sweater. Oh, we have a runner. There's a runner. Should we? We have a mic runner. Yes. Mic runner would be a good game. Mic runner, mic ladies runner. and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Microphone dash. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we're, we're being yeah, there's podcast. A, there's a recording. So. Okay. I'll just, uh, we'll hold um. It's not that mic. One more time. We're still working out time? the kinks, people. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I'm... <laughs> okay, we'll just point that mic that way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I guess I'm still interested in the uh, question of representation. Um, and uh, if you don't... If you're done talking about it, I apologize. Um, and you, you, your ideas about it and its relation to perhaps the um, the other stuff that that games are made of, the stuff that's maybe underneath what you see with representation. And I, I was thinking about um, your example of Animal Crossing, and um, one of the other examples that you had um, that followed later, um, that you can imagine a game that works a lot like Animal Crossing, um, where instead of burying the cute stuff for your apartment, you're burying maybe prostitutes that you've killed. Um, and, you know, instead of shaking trees, you're shaking down drug dealers for yeah. money. And it starts to look a lot like another game that you had, which was Grand Theft Auto, where you're a new person in town. Wouldn't it be awesome you, to have Grand Theft Auto Animal Crossing? Yeah, yeah it would be totally, <laughs> totally fun. Yeah. Right, so you, you're, you're a new person in town, and um, you start picking up all these menial tasks. You get better and better at them. You, you, you get some material success. You get real estate. Um, all of these things, right? And so, under the hood, maybe these games actually kind of re resemble themselves quite a lot. Um, is that the model? I mean, is it just a coincidence, maybe, that they both ended up at the same model with two different jumping off points? Well, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's an interesting argument that would require more evidence. But, <laughs> I mean, there are games that are very similar to one another. And one of the things that we have, one of the tools that we have to affect representation in games is that surface layer, that skin. So one of the you know so this idea of skinning things of kind of taking the logic of one game and then mm. and then trying to strap on a new skin in order to make it mean something different sometimes works and sometimes doesn't I, I think it goes deeper than that with with Animal Crossing and Grand Theft Auto but in many other cases especially actually in, in serious games this is a bit common to take a, a popular game because you know people like platformers or they like driving games or what have you and we'll just put our message on top of it by taking the Mario style game and making it about the rainforest and you're saving the rainforest by avoiding the chainsaws and jumping over the logs which is a game that actually exists um, but it's not about saving the rainforest by jumping over the logs because that's not how we save the rainforest by jumping over the logs and the, and, and the flying chainsaws right so this idea of a kind of tight coupling between um, what's on the surface and what's underneath between the model and its um, its depiction its skin is an important uh, kind of design factor that's at work. Now, I don't think that if we stripped away the cartooniness of, of Animal Crossing and we laid on top the um, the gritty, you know, criminal underground uh, of Grand Theft Auto that we'd actually have uh, the same game. But there are cer cer similar properties of you know amassing wealth, of uh, of attempting to deal with you know kind of the, the development of um, of influence and having to manage the uh, uh, the properties or the other resources that one has. Um, but you know there are also those commonalities among very different kinds of, of films or books or, or, or photographs or what have you. Um, so I, I, I mean, yes, but also no. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to follow, just follow up on that the, about issues of representation and structure in games. 
And I guess I wanted to keep on pushing you where Frank had a little bit, Ian, which was that when Frank asked you, who someone who's a sort of scholar of and writes about games of rhetoric and persuasion and a designer of such games, to actually name a game where you felt like you had, it was the, the SimCity uh, answer, but I don't know if it's that, that had persuaded you or that you had learned something. And your answer was SimCity, but what you said was that it's a horrible model, but it shows you that variables can be tweaked. Uh, and some of those variables might include taxes and transportation and, and that sort of thing. And I guess, you know, my, my question is the same as Frank's, and just to follow up on that answer, it, it, if that's the best example of rhetoric or persuasion that we can point to, it, it, it's kind of like saying, well, I know this isn't well-designed furniture, but this, this box shows right. you that there is a thing called a chair which should be there and could be sat upon, right? <laughs> so say, it's, that's not really solving the problem. It's, it's like a mound of something that you can sort of sit on that points to the idea that there should be a chair there. Um, it's similar to saying, well, the, none of the models really work in SimCity. They don't have anything to do with the reality. If they did, it might not be fun. So it's kind of a fun game. But all it does is sort of points in that direction. So it seems like there's a, that's a really important question for games um, and, and sort of how they operate. Is Maybe that's asking the wrong question. Maybe the wrong question about the Save the Rainforest game is not that it's teaching you how to save rainforests, but it's getting a kid interested in the notion of saving a sure. rainforest, and then they might do more research about it. But then that's kind of relegating games to kind of marketing on, on social yeah, issues. Yeah, or, yeah. So I think it's a really complicated question, but if, if we're going to take the, the notion of games for rhetoric, uh, games being rhetorical devices seriously, then it, it's, it's kind of like the Citizen Kane uh, question. We can't really point to any good examples of them. So then maybe we're just asking the wrong question. Well, I mean, there are there are not as many good examples as there ought to be, but I think that the examples that Where, are out well, from whence comes the alt? I guess that's my question. Maybe maybe that's the maybe that's the problem. Yeah, this is you don't hear whence and ought uh, enough, <laughs> in my opinion. There aren't as many good examples as I would like there to be, but I think there are lots of little pieces of examples. There there are, there are these these little moments in many good commercial games. Um, <laughs> That make small arguments. They're just, the, the, the games don't usually try to try to extend that to the entirety of the experience. So you know when you play um, Grand Theft Auto to keep with that game, um, there are all of these little dynamics that are at work that are kind of in some ways secondary to the to the uh, to the story behind the game, like the experience of um, of being a, uh, a a criminal of a different kind, but is always starting out as this kind of this kind of tragic figure who then has to make his way up. And, and in some cases that works out well, but it never never really works out well. Like you, in, in in San Andreas, you you experience this this um, uh, uh, this wrong at the start of the game that then you try to right by really being this kind of this kind of Horatio Alger figure who is also still a criminal, or um, or in Grand Theft Auto Four the same thing kind of turns around on you in, in a way that you don't expect, or an example that I've talked about before in relation to, to Grand Theft Auto is this this whole notion of um, of of money and uh, and and eating that's that's in uh, in San Andreas that, that you have to you have to eat to be to be um, uh, to have energy, but you can't eat anything but crappy junk food, which is just the, touches the very surface of uh, of an interesting argument about a relationship between socioeconomics and health. So I think I think this stuff is like littered throughout games. It's just that the, most games do not strive for a kind of social message of that sort. They don't try to make commentary of that kind. Now, do, whether they ought to or not is a, is a different yeah, question. Yeah, that's. The, I mean, do they need to in order they to not, be they, worthy of our attention? In order to be worthy of Studying them in, in the academy and teaching them no, they, they, at they, they the need not. university level. They need not. In the same way, okay. I don't think we want them all to do so either. We'd want some of them to do we, that. We, we might, we might, we might want to ask if if some of them did that very explicitly and they wore on their sleeves. Hey, this is what I'm about. I'm I make I'm a call to action about uh, issue X. Mm -hmm. Then I don't think it would hurt anyone. Yeah. But that j doesn't tend to be the kind of formula that we that we see developed in in big commercial games. Uh, another question. Uh, you in the hat. Yeah, I have. Uh, do I need a mic or am I okay? Mic them up. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I have um, two questions. Uh, firstly, with regards to um, building a model and playing within a model, how do abstract games like Pong or, or uh, those very, very early games, and I can't think of anything. Um, Pong is abstract? What? Is Pong abstract? Pac-Man. Uno. <laughs> Uno, then. A game like Uno, how does that, how do, how does that fit into your your argument about building a model and exploring a model? Some games don't have models of this kind. Some games are not representational. Okay. Pong, Pong yeah. is, though. So is, I, I mean, Pac-Man is, is weirdly so. But, I mean, Uno, I don't know what to say about 
Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not a video game. Right. Maybe Some it's games, just a card game that happens out, to you, know, that might be, you so, play it, it on a 360. It, yeah, you play it on a 360. Yeah. That's the easy way to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, second question. Oh, yeah. Oh, Go. Keep going. Yeah. My second. Oh, that was satisfying. Is... Okay. Oh. Well, I got off the hook. Works for me. I, okay. uh, good yeah. short no, answer is fine. I like it. No, that's that's the answer. Some games are not representational. Um. No, I'd, I'd like to just turn what we've been talking about on its head. And as as a player, how do you play? How do you engage in a world like Fallout? How how do you engage in a world uh, like Fallout? Is there a way one should engage in a world like Fallout to to um, get the most immersion out of it? To um, I, th I think I've said enough. But. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I guess I try to I bring whatever specific questions I have about what I think the game is trying to speak to, um, and then I see what it has to say. I I, I think you know the, one should one should approach games of any kind in the same way that that one approaches other kinds of of expressive media, which is which is with an with an open mind, intending to, to find something interesting inside of them. And that interest could be abstract. It could be, wow, I really like the the strange and crazy shapes. Um, that are at work, and I don't know what to say about them other than they give me a sort of sort of sensory pleasure. Or it could be, hmm, you know, this is an interesting essay on uh, on this apocalyptic future. Um, but you know, uh, we have to approach games with an open mind. We have to look for what they are saying, not what we want them to say or what we, the experience we want to have with them. So a lot of times when you read about um, players' reactions to, to video games on the internet. Um, they, they fall into you know, a, a few different kinds of categories, but one of the commonest is this game did not do for me what I expected it to do, which was what that other game did. And if only it had done what that other game did, uh, but a little bit better, then I would have been gratified. So we have to be willing to be surprised and, and get something that we didn't expect. I think he wants to know whether you blew up Megaton or whether you saved Megaton. Oh, those sorts of things. <laughs> Did, or did you just not care? Is it, I mean, it's, I mean it's, do you find that stuff? I find it. I find banal? it. I find it sort of ridiculous that these okay. are the sorts of choices that, yeah. that end up, you know, being, we're, we're, we're admit, fed as meaningful. Let's yeah. admit that's banal. Yeah. Um, maybe some of us liked it. What uh, orange a sweater? Um, I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, wait for the mic. Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> So is the mic handler uh, mic? Sorry to, no. I, I don't no. really want to pile on with this question, but I guess oh, boy. just my, my, my question always is um, if you, can you give an example of a game that has rhetoric absent a uh, layer of representation? What do you mean by a layer of, of representation? In other words, like an abstract you know, game an abstract that game. still yeah. makes an oh, argument. Well, I mean, the, the best example of this is is Janet Murray's old reading of Tetris, right, in which she argues that Tetris is about uh, modern work. And everything's constantly piling up, and the, the moment that you get something done, there's something more there to deal with. Yeah. Okay. That's that seems like a good answer, right? I mean, in a way, <laughs> the, my 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 problem with that is that I feel like all games express that idea in a way. All games are about work in that way. Yeah. So to say Tetris is about that, it implies that Alexei Pajitnov wanted to say something about work. No, Alexei Pajitnov wanted to well, no, it discover it, something it, it, about it, mathematics it, and the human brain and, and how those two things fit together to create a weird kind of pleasure. Those two and ideas as a result, are, are something about work has been said. Sure, those yeah. two ideas are not incompatible though. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's an interesting interpretation. The, 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 the objection, like the classic objection from, from Marco Esquilinen was, Oh, that's stupid, essentially. Like, that's stupid, which I don't think is a satisfying objection. Um, and, and, you know, his argument is, no, you don't learn anything about the game by talking about it in those terms. You don't learn you know, how it works or, or, or what, how it deals with time or how it deals with objects in space. And, and those things may or may not be true. But um, at the same time, you know, Tetris is often played, it's like played like solitaire you know, at work. And when you're, you're actually not working, yeah. when you're playing this game that might be about all the stuff piling up. So this is kind of a strange, beautiful, strangely beautiful situation that, that, that can be constructed around Tetris. I mean, you know, whether or not it's the most, most exciting uh, interpretation of the game is a different question, but it is, it is an interpretation of an, and, and a I, so-called abstract game. And I think a key game. insight here is that, it, that that wasn't put there in the game. Yeah. Right? It wasn't placed there on purpose as, as in, right? So that's, that's an interesting, and maybe that's true of poetry and photography. Well, when, or maybe I it's mean, slightly different. Maybe no, no, it's, it's, a way it's, in which it's the games same. Are, I mean, it's the same. It's, okay. the, it's this idea of dissemination that, you know, right. things go out there in the world. and then, It's more obvious in the case of games. And I think it helps us actually look back at things like photography. And, and Why is it more obvious? Well, I just think it is. I mean, it's more obvious that, it is. that some... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not, but but it's because maybe it's just because it's it's because new, a it's... poem is is 
has uh -huh. kind of the form of a statement, uh -huh. right? It's it's more looks like something where oh the meaning of the poem was the thing that the poet put there, uh -huh. right? Oh, Whereas I see in, what you're in the case of a game, it seems it's less like that. It seems like oh look, there's this interesting that, you know, meaning of this game, yeah. but it's not because that was put there in order to be conveyed, but it was more like but it's definitely there. But I think it's also true of of, of poems and photographs that it's not really the thing that was put there that is necessarily the no, it's the, the interpretive act. Yeah. 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 Um, other questions from people? Uh, white uh, smock and and bandizi. Uh, yes, uh, I like it. Um, I guess my really like yeah. Talk, yeah. talk right yeah. into the mic. When um, he had asked, like, where what where would you have someone begin? Like, you know, what games would you recommend, or where to begin? And, like, I had pong. I had pong. We still have it at home. It's like Sears and Roebuck. But then I played games for about 15 years, and then the real world hit for me, and my career took a different way. And so I stepped out of that world. And now my curiosity and wanting to be the back part of it, now I don't know where to start from. So uh -huh. I know, I don't know everything, but like I understand the basics of you know, the development from Pong to Atari to Nintendo to that. But now there's been the last... How about Eve Online? Life. Would you suggest? <laughs> how about Eve, try Eve Online? I think that's a good that's game for you. I'm, I'm, it's not a good game Isn't that for like you. A no, no, <laughs> it's a giant. No, that would be terribly you know, inappropriate. I, I bet it's it. a giant. Eve Online is a, is a giant space uh, MMO. It's a big game about politics and and space ships. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess the you know the pong answer may have seemed flip, but but what it was what it was meant to suggest was that. You know, we have to look at we have to look historically at the way that games have evolved in relation to one another, and I think that that, that same advice can apply to um, to any kind of observation that we want to make. Like, for example, I don't know very much about MMOs because I don't play them, and if I wanted to learn about them more seriously, then I would want to go back and understand where this kind of online social play came from. So I, I resist this this notion of learning about video games as this as this like singular medium, if I dare use that word, but in the same way that if, if someone said to me, you know, I, I used to read novels. Um, and I've just, like, I haven't been reading novels, you know, for the past, right. you know, 10 or 20 years. Like, where, where should I start? <laughs> oh, you know, well, it's a complicated question. I mean, wh where, did you, where, did you, where did you end up in, in, yeah. in the first place? Or what kind of novel are we talking about? Are we talking about the, you know, the, the kind of postmodern? Um, right. But you end up there because everybody reads novels in school. When they're uh, th this, that's up. true, too. So it, it, it does not... make it, it makes the comparison less effective. Um, um, I'm sorry, I was going to take another question. Are you, keep going. No, oh, okay. that's fine. Uh, one, one more question. Oh, we have one more. Can, this... I, can I throw in a plug? Yes, can throw in a plug. Can, can I have a, a, two questions then, if you throw in a plug? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> one plug and then we'll do two more questions. Go. If you want to play video games, you should come to the Game Center Open Library on Friday afternoon. That's right. The Game Center is creating a library of, of, of digital and non-digital games that you have access to. So yeah. when is it open? A canon, if you will. Fridays from 3 to 9 on the ninth floor of this building. So please come and, and play games and, and play Pong and learn pong. about history. Yeah. Only yes. Pong. Okay, uh, yes, the Last man one. with the mic. My question sort of deals with that. Um, now, when we're speaking about you know, the starting of this whole idea of game studies and video game studies, um, there seems to be a lack of cultural institutions or some place that you can go to study these things. I mean, you can go... Where do you go to play Pong? I mean, yeah, right. I see what you're saying. Where do you go to play, you know, Space Wars? You right. know, and does the you know the Museum of the Movie Image has that little collection over there? But you know, that's nothing to you know throw a hat at. It's nothing to be able to study around. So, what do you think the idea of the lack of cultural institutions for game studies outside of like you know the downfall of the arcade, which if you guys go to Chinatown, it's weird. Yeah, one. yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, in in some ways. The idea that Nick and I have, in, in part with this platform study series, is to address that to some extent, not through the construction of, of facilities where people can play Pong, but by, by chronicling and making observations about uh, these systems as they existed and as they were developed. So a lot of this stuff is going to be lost to history, not, the not just the games themselves, but the, the information about how they were made and where they came from. No, it doesn't have to be, but so, so I guess what I'm saying is in one part it's, it's the, the host is not a host for the, the artifacts themselves, but we, what we can, part of that work has to be done through research about those, those artifacts that then gets published in ways that people can read about. I, I have this problem every term when I, go to, when I go to play all of these games, of course, and there are, there are means of, of uh, 
playing arcade games and things like that in emulation, but it's not the same, and, and there are all sorts of factors it's that are lost. It's pretty much the same. Um, except it's Come not. on. Well, let me give you a concrete example that's about, that's about the Atari instead of about Pong. One of the, one of the things that I'm interested in with, with the Atari is the, the, the material construction of the image and the situation in which it would have been played, and the importance of the television, of the old CRT television mm. to Atari games um, really can't be overstated. So one of the problems with the emulator, which is a useful tool, is that it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't depict the image in a, in a way that's, that's faithful to the way that a CRT does. And so I have a, a, a computer science capstone group at, at Georgia Tech this term working on a, a better CRT emulator for the Stella, the Stella emulator for, uh, for Atari, which has um, you know, better, better scan line bleed, better, better phosphor bleed, a better flicker um, you know, in terms of the, 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 the delay that it takes for the, for the image to dissipate. Um, the, the, the way that a, uh, if, you look, if you look at a television up close, of course, the, the color image is constructed with these three beams that are they're shining through a grate, and so you get a, a certain texture to the screen, which is lost on the emulator. So you know, we're working to, to look at, at some of those important factors that didn't make their way into the emulator and add them, and that works because it's an open source project that we can add it to. Uh, that's one example. It's just one example, and there's no there's no um, blanket answer to the question. But we have to do a lot of stuff like that. We can't simply rely on archives. I, I would suggest also that maybe maybe you would agree or disagree with this, but that's almost what's m most needed is not access necessarily to the games, which is kind of easy to get, um, but a context within which to appreciate them, like a yeah, community, yeah, yeah. a discursive yeah. community, really to understand. Well, what's your reaction to to bounce your to to have a social context? Or what games should I be looking at? What old games should I be looking at? And how you know what's interesting about them? And and um, so I think forming that kind of community is almost more important than having direct access to to a certain type of equipment. And, and one of the things that we'll probably see is the same thing that happens with any kind of rare object is that it's housed in in some location or maybe a few locations, and then we have to go to it. This this is what archival research is about. Unfortunately, archival research for games has not yet gotten to the point where. We even have catalogs of the, the stuff that's been donated to places like Texas or places like Stanford. Mm -hmm. And that's work yet to be done. Uh, one more question. Um, I'm going to go all the way in the back. Yes. Thanks, Ian, for the talk. Uh, I was really uh, compelled by your idea of uh, logical immersion. Um, and I wanted you to riff on that a little more, if you could, especially um, about how Typical immersion, sensory immersion, um, seems to be more about displacing you from your environs. Um, and, but logical immersion might c conflict with the idea of role playing, where you know you're taking on this role. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering how, yeah. how, how logical immersion works. So there, there's this idea in my first book um, that I called simulation fever, although I might have called it sim sickness. I kind of wish I had I in, both. in retrospect. Yeah. Um, um, which is the, the sensation that you have when you're when you're playing that role constrained by those rules that it's it's wrong. There's something about it that's unfamiliar and disturbing, and that that kind of dissonance between those those two sensations, the sensation that you have some idea of how your world operates, and then when when you are uh, when you're immersed in this other way of looking at it, that you're bothered by it, and you have to kind of reconcile those those two ideas. That's one way that that takes place. So it's kind of a you know a way of playing a role critically that doesn't involve uh, losing yourself in it, or rather maybe involves losing yourself and then coming back up for air and then going back down again. Nice. So that's one that's one place that I've talked about that. Nice. Um, all right, I think that we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. To all of you, please come back. We're going to do more of these. We have Warren Spector coming, Clint Hawking, Eric Zimmerman, Katie Salen, uh, Mark LeBlanc, Jonathan Blow, the creative braid. So we're going to do a lot of these. They're open to the public. So please bring your friends, bring anyone who's interested in games. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>